everyone, uh, and welcome to our symposium on local public uh, participation and engagement. I'm Steve Boylard, the Executive Director at the Center for California Studies at Sacramento State. Um, many of you know the Center for our uh, Fellows programs, but uh, the broader mission of the Center is to strengthen democratic governance in California. And one of the ways historically we've looked at that theme is with the idea of, uh, of civic engagement, civic education. So a few years ago, the center, uh, in partnership with the California Debt and Investment Advisory Commission, CDF, uh, uh, administered a number of research grants that looked at local public finance issues. And this symposium is, I think, kind of a capstone to that um, series of events, and where we're trying to connect together uh, all these pieces, civic engagement, strengthening democratic governance, um, and local public finance. So, uh, specifically, um, this symposium is supposed to uh, explore the effect that citizen engagement has on uh, the ability of local governments to develop sound fiscal policies. More, for example, uh, highly active citizenry certainly, you know, has been argued, can uh, keep local leaders uh, under observation and making sure that they um, are responsive uh, to uh, their citizens. But this symposium gets at not just what is the um, uh, uh, degree of public engagement, but also what's the nature of that public engagement. How do individuals express preferences align or not align with collective good? Um, to what extent do they reflect an understanding of the issues? How do they recognize policy trade-offs? And could the good thing that is public engagement become a hindrance to sound fiscal decision making. So, you know, what I guess we're trying to do is muddy a little bit this um, uh, common uh, notion that, that all public participation is inherently good. And we want to look at the places where that kind of becomes more of a problem. Uh, so we've put together a great program for you. And when I say we, I really want to thank in particular uh, my colleague Tara Townsend, who's walking in the back there, who's really done the lion's share of the work here today. I'd also like to thank our hosts at the California Association um, of, uh, of Counties, as well as CDAC for their support for uh, this whole series of projects. So let me give you an overview of our program today. Um, we're going to begin with a presentation by uh, David Barker of Sacramento State Institute for Social Research and Kim Nalder, who directs the uh, uh, university's um, Project for an Informed Electorate. And the two of them have, have worked on some survey research that's looking at local uh, citizens and how they understand and engage with their local governments. We'll have that presentation and we'll move to a, a question and answer. Um, ending up somewhere around 11.30. We'll then break for lunch, and we'll have a buffet line set up here. We ask that you get yourself some food and come back to your tables, and then we'll proceed with a uh, panel discussion. And in this panel discussion, we have a number of local officials and other uh, researchers and stakeholders who will be commenting on uh, and offering their views on this theme. Um, there are biographies um, for all of our panelists in your uh, packets. The presentation of the panel discussion will be led by Peter Detweiler, who many of you know as uh, somebody who's been in public service for about 40 years, including a long stint with the Senate Local Government Committee. So um, we'll, after the panel, move to a uh, Q&A again, and we'll be finished here about 1 o'clock. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce, turn the podium over to uh, David and, and Kim. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Steve, and, and thanks, Tara, for, um, for doing all of your work to put this together, and thank all of you uh, for coming out today. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Dave Barker. I'm the director for the Institute for Social Research at uh, Sex State, and I'm going to be talking for a little while, and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to Kim Nalder, who is the director for the project for an informed electorate. Uh, we're actually also both political scientists as well, <clears throat> by training and and Kim more full time. Uh, and so when Steve first approached us about this and we first started talking about it, I thought it was a, a fascinating question, not only from the perspective of local governance and, and you know, budgets and 
you know, this, you know, this era of fiscal constraint that we're all living in, etc., but also in terms of this basic democratic question, you know, of, you know, when, you know, is political participation always good? Um, what is the distinction between engagement and information and how those interact? And, and could it be the case, right, that, that in certain circumstances with regard to certain types of issues that, that, that maybe democratic uh, uh, participation might hinder the ability of local leaders to, um, to serve the public good. So you know, it's, it's a, a fascinating question, both in an applied sense and in more of a, a the democratic theory kind of sense. So, so we were excited to do this. And um, before I go any further, I want to actually thank you have to turn this on. I'm still a, a right on chalkboard kind of guy, so, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah, I want to uh, thank the, the rest of our team who really did so much work on this. Michael Small, who's a research analyst at the Institute for Social Research. Uh, Ted Lasher, who's the Dean of Social Sciences and Interdisciplinary Studies, and also a professor in the Department of Public Policy Administration. Kelly Nelson, who is a graduate research assistant at Sac State uh, in the Sociology Department. And Ted Ryan, who, Ted, are you here? Here? Um, he's not. But he actually just um, got his uh, master's degree from the Department of Public Policy Administration. And all these folks really uh, helped to bring this together um, and, and worked very hard. Okay, so the basic research questions that we are considering with this project are as follows. First of all, right, we just want to understand at the municipal level, do Californians tend to prioritize budgetary balance? Or do they prioritize, you know, the city um, investing in more services, in more essential services? Or do they just want lower taxes, right? What do people want? Do people like balanced budgets? Do they prioritize those? Or do they prioritize, prioritize these other things? Secondly, um, when it comes to spending at the local level, at the city or town level, what do people want to spend money on? What services are most important to folks? Third. Uh, as Steve was talking about and as I was alluding to a minute ago. How knowledgeable are people about this stuff? And how sophisticated are those preferences? Do they make sense? Fourth, how engaged and participatory are Californians when it comes to voting and local elections and um, contacting their public officials, etc.? And then finally, how does all this fit together? Right? How do civic engagement and civic knowledge interact or condition one another to ultimately influence um, individual attitudes towards budgets and spending and taxes, etc. With the idea being, if there's a relationship there, then we can draw some inferences about what that means at the, at the aggregate level in terms of policy. Making. Okay, so what do we do? And we can, you know, in case anybody happens to be interested, when all this is over, I can, you know, either one of us can talk about uh, the details of, of what we did, we're giving you a, a very general overview today. But in a, a very simple, in, in simple terms, we did a, a survey, a random digit dialing phone survey of Californians, 70% uh, landline phone, 30% cell, which mimics about the uh, proportion of the population now that's cell only. Um, and we uh, did this during the month of April mostly, uh, April 4th through May 8th. We wound up completing 938 interviews. Uh, we restricted our sample to folks living in cities or towns. Um, there's a reason for that that I'll come back to in a second. Uh, but we drew them from 30 different cities or towns that were randomized. So first we randomly selected counties within uh, the state uh, from each region. Right? So we uh, divided things up in terms of you know coastal, uh, Northern California, inland Northern California, Southern California, coastal, and Southern California, inland. And then we sampled, randomly drew counties from each of those four regions, and then randomly drew cities within each of those counties, uh, weighting according to population. You know, you, you have, you know, Moore and, and um, LA, for example. Uh, and as I said, we excluded residents who didn't live in cities. And the reason for that is that we uh, wanted to find out what the fiscal situations were of the individual towns in which these folks lived, right? And that's difficult to do if you're collecting 
data on people who live out in the, in the county somewhere in the unincorporated areas, right? So everywhere we're in each of these cities, um, we looked up and we found out whether or not um, the city in 2012 ran a budget deficit and also what their overall debt uh, was that they carried in 2013. Okay, so what does our sample look like? First of all, in terms of basic demographics, uh, we were pretty happy, actually, oops, that our average respondent looks like the average adult in California, pretty close. We've got a, a few uh, numbers that are skewed here, but these, these are pretty good. Our average respondent is about 50 years old, has lived in his or her town for 20 years, has some college experience, right, but is not a college graduate, and earns about uh, $49,000 a year. That's a little low. The average Californian actually earns around $60,000 a year, so that one's a little bit low, but it's still not too bad. 56% uh, 50 of the sample uh, are women, which is slightly high, but only by about three percentage points. 53% uh, are non-Hispanic whites. 30% uh, are Hispanic, that's a little low, right? I think the overall population is about 38% Hispanic. 4% uh, are African American, that's pretty close. I think 6% uh, of, of um, California are African American. 5% uh, are Asian American, that's a little low. I think 13% of Californians are Asian American, 2% are Native American, and 7% are multiracial. Okay, what about party identification? <coughs> this we were really kind of surprised actually because, you know, again, this isn't a a completely randomized survey of the entire population in California, right? It's, it's randomized within each of these cities or towns, but we don't have the entire population. So we were surprised, actually, that these came out so well. These are, these numbers mimic almost perfectly um, the party ID numbers from the 2012 <coughs> election in California. So 45% Democrat, 26% Republican, 29% Independent. When you break that down into more useful numbers, when you include uh, people who uh, say they're independents but admit to leaning toward the Democratic Party, who for all intents and purposes are, are Democrats in terms of how they vote, uh, we're talking about 48%, 33% uh, Republican and Republican leaners, and pure independents, right? Folks who say they're independent but then, and really are, uh, about 19%. And again, that looks almost exactly like um, turnout uh, on election day in 2012. All right, so what do people prefer? What do people want? Right? Again, going back to this question of do people want balanced budgets? Do people want more spending? Do people want lower taxes? Well, this first item here asks people whether it's more important for cities and towns to minimize taxes or to balance the budget, right? So it's a, just a taxes versus budget balance trade-off. And as you can see, it's almost uh, a perfect, you know, bell curve uh, with the um, with the uh, uh, the mean being right in the in the middle. And so we have, you know, roughly 40% uh, of the sample. Um, this well, I should rephrase. About 50% of the sample says that they prefer uh, budget balance. And about 50% of the sample says that they prefer lower taxes. So it's right in the middle. So what about spending? Same thing. We're surprised, right? So it's right in the middle. It's divided. Right? About half the population, or not the half the population, but half of the folks who we interviewed uh, said that they preferred that the city or town invest in important services. And about half said that they prefer that their um, city or town's budget be balanced. All right, so when you look at this a little bit um, deeper, surprisingly, uh, we found that there were few differences in terms of those attitudes according to really any demographics. We listed party ID, attendance to local news, and gender, but really it didn't, uh, it wasn't predictable by anything. Um, trying to figure out who wants budgetary balance versus more spending, who wants budgetary balance versus uh, lower taxes. You would, we would have thought that would have been predictable by um, party ID, right? You would have expected, um, you know, Democrats to prefer more spending and Republicans to prefer lower taxes. And, you know, tend, we tend to think at least, uh, we assume, that, like we hear in the news supposedly, that Republicans are more into budgetary balance than Democrats are. 
But that wasn't true. And it, and it wasn't true in, according to any of the other demographics that we have. Uh, so overall, about 35%, when you combine those two questions and you, and you, and you break them down right, to get the, the bigger picture, about 35% of the sample says they want to balance the budget. Okay? So in response to both of those items, right, they, they prefer balance over spending and they prefer balance over low taxes. Another 35% is on the opposite side. They prefer both. They, we, want, we like more spending and we like lower taxes. <laughs> okay? We don't care about balancing the budget. And then about 30% are in the middle, right? where they like, say, for example, uh, balanced budget relative to spending money on stuff that they think isn't important. Uh, but maybe they prefer lower taxes. Okay. Uh, now then, on what do people want to spend money? What do people think is the most important thing on, on which a city or town should spend money? So we ask people uh, a series of questions, right, uh, about things that cities and towns spend money on to see, again, whether or not people thought that their city or town should spend more, less, or the same amount of money on these various items, right? So the first one is public safety, right? Which is one of the things that we all know cities and, and towns spend a lot of money on. And so, uh, as you can see here, um, very few people think that we should spend less money on public safety. And that's not surprising, right? Most people think that we should spend more money on cops and firefighters, etc. And a large number of people also think that we should just keep things where they are. But almost nobody, 10%, wants to spend less. Those numbers are pretty similar, uh, statistically the same, actually, when it comes to spending on infrastructure, like roads or bridges, etc. Right? Uh, an even higher percentage, right? 48% think that we should spend more money on those things. About 40% say keep it where it is. 10% say less. So again, everybody wants more spending, right? What about um, on parks, uh, libraries, swimming pools, that kind of thing? Um, you see the, things change a little bit here, right? It's a lower percentage of people who think that we should spend more money on public enrichment, but a lot of people want to spend about the same. And overall, you've got 82% uh, saying that, that, that we should either keep things where they are or spend more. Again, hardly anybody, 14%, says that we should spend less money on those things. Um, now, here's where things actually look different. And we were trying to identify something, right? Trying to think, like, well, what is something that people might want to spend less money on, right? So we asked about public employee benefits, like pensions. Uh, and indeed, 31% of the public says that we should spend less money on, you know, those bloated pensions. Um, however, a little bit to my surprise at least, we haven't talked about this, but um, still most people think that, that those pensions are, are a-okay. Uh, I don't know, well, maybe we should have looked at the percentage of our sample who is employed by the state. But, uh, uh, but, you know, adding those numbers together, we get about 60%. Uh, who say that, uh, that they're fine with that. Now, um, when it comes to spending on economic development, like subsidies to businesses, again, we're trying to identify things that people might not be into. Again, uh, the majority of people say that we should spend plenty of money on that stuff, and, and even more, uh, with 27% saying we should spend less than 11%. Here's one thing that's different. 11% saying that they haven't really thought about this one. They don't, they don't really know. Okay. Keep in mind, we're going to come back to this in a little bit. Kim's going to talk about this. But the percentage of people who haven't thought much about these things is way higher than what we actually get. Right? We see 11% of the population is willing to admit that they haven't ever thought about these things. But I think, and I don't want to steal too much of Kim's thunder, but as we'll see a little bit later, there are reasons to believe that that number is a lot higher. Okay, now what about taxes? So in, in sum, right, we could say that most people want to spend more money. And most people want to spend more money on everything. Right? So what about taxes then? If everybody wants to spend, well not everybody, right, but if, if two-thirds or so of the public wants to spend more money on stuff, then that would probably mean that they, that they want to, you know, increase taxes, right, to pay for it. Uh, well, 4% of our 
sample thinks that sales taxes are too low, right? And however, 44% um, actually say that they think taxes are about right, which again was slightly surprising to me. I kind of imagined or, or predicted that, you know, 80% of the sample would say taxes were too high. Uh, but it's actually only 41%. Only so uh, a decent number of people here uh, have a, a good sense, of, at, at least in, in terms of, you know, depending on how you want to think about it, that if, hey, if we're going to spend more money, because you figure most of these folks are saying that we, we should be spending more money on more things, then maybe we should at least keep taxes where they are. Not raise them, but maybe not cut them. All right. So, this is again just kind of summing up. 58% want to increase spending on balance overall when you sum up all those items. 24% uh, want to cut spending. 23% want a tax cut and more spending. Right? So about a quarter. About a quarter want that. 35% you could say are fiscal liberals, right? They, uh, they, they want to keep taxes the same uh, or increase them, but they want to increase services. 21% want everything to stay as it is, and then about 21% you can classify as fiscal liberals, right? Or fiscal, well, not, not exactly fiscal conservatives, but um, ideological conservatives when it comes to these uh, questions in the sense of wanting a tax cut, but no spending. Okay. So, how engaged are folks? Because right? again, the, the thing that we ultimately want to get to here is this relationship between how participatory and engaged people are, and also how informed they are, and how that fits together. So now let's move on to this engagement part. So 67% report voting in the last election. Um, that actually might not be terribly inflated, because uh, the last election for a lot of these folks, even though we're, we, we specifically asked them about local elections, but that would have been the 2012 presidential election. And uh, believe it or not, that's, that's not much higher than, than the reported turnout in, in 2012 for that election. 20% uh, report having contacted a local public official either by letter, phone, or email in the last year. So now we want to take uh, just a, a couple of minutes uh, to talk about folks' approval of public officials and how that compares at the local level versus the state level. So we asked people um, what they thought about the mayor uh, and their, a member of uh, or, or city council in general versus the governor and the state legislature. <coughs> we also asked how they how trustworthy they thought these folks were, how competent they thought these folks were and then how efficacious they are, or the, the degree to which people feel like they can make a difference, or, or that, that the government listens to them. Okay. So just running over this real quickly, uh, the thing to take away here, and these numbers are difficult for you to see, uh, and we actually left off the, the state legislature numbers, but the takeaway point from this is that people are in general, uh, in general hold their local public officials in higher esteem than they do state officials. And we know already that people tend to hold state officials in higher esteem than they do um, national level politicians like the president or the congress. But uh, in, in general, we see that, that folks like the mayor um, the most. Uh, they like their city council um, the second best uh, relative to the governor and the state legislature, again, which we didn't put in here. They come in last. What about trust? Again, and these numbers are so different than what you see at the national level, where hardly anybody trusts the federal government to do the right thing. You know, we've seen for 30 years in, in uh, surveys uh, at the national level, we ask people, you know, um, talking about the, the federal government, you know, will they, can you trust them to do the right thing most of the time? And hardly anybody says yes anymore. It's about the same percentage of people who check that box on the IRS to say they want to donate three bucks or whatever it is to the, to the um, to the campaigns. That, lots of people used to do that, actually. You know, back in the 60s, most people checked that box, but nobody does anymore. And back in the 60s, most people said that they, they trusted the government to do the right thing, but nobody does anymore. However, that's not true here. We actually see 60%, uh, actually 61%, 61% uh, 
saying that they trust the people running their city or town to do the right thing most of the time. Uh, similarly, about 57% say that the folks running the city or town know what they're doing. <coughs> and this one is a little bit more mixed. Uh, about 48%, uh, and it's a little less than half, I think that, um, that the government you know, listens to people like that, basically. Okay, so now then, back to a little bit more on attentiveness. 62% claim to have followed the news, uh, whether on the internet or TV or newspaper or what have you, um, on at least five days last week. 52% claim to have done so on six or more days. And 48% claim to have done so every last week. We are virtually certain that these numbers are important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't pay attention to the news seven days last week. Right? And, and I mean, I don't know. If I didn't, chances are not that many. Exactly. All right. At this point, uh, we're going to start talking about uh, the knowledge items, which um, are maybe some of the most interesting and, and, and relevant uh, to you guys. I'm going to go ahead and hand the baton over to Kim uh, to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank sounds like, um, trying to create more knowledge in the electorate uh, so that people can be more engaged and have a better impact on, on sort of the outcomes they have. So we were especially interested in looking at knowledge uh, with this sample for local fiscal questions. So we asked five questions to gauge fiscal knowledge. Three of them are local, two of them are state level. They have to be broad enough to apply to different cities uh, and broad enough that you know, some people will get them right. Uh, some, some questions will be so specific that nobody will get them right. So we asked, um, is your city budget in surplus, deficit, or balance? Um, what is your city's sales tax rate, roughly? We accepted a range of answers. We didn't expect to be people to have it down exactly. Um, was the state budget last year in surplus, deficit, or balance? So that's sort of, you know, people basically attentive to fiscal issues, even at the state level, which would be in the news a lot more than the city unless you're in Stockton or someplace like that, obviously. Um, has this year's state budget improved, stayed the same, or gotten worse? And then we asked a, a, another question that was a spending jurisdiction question with only one right answer that I'll get to in a minute in some more detail. And then we, um, from that, made an index for the local with the three local questions, and then for all of the questions together, a five-point index. So what we found is that 25% could tell us about their local budget and get that right. 65% um, were within a few points of the sales tax question, so that's not so bad, but part of the reason that's higher is because we gave so much to the <laughs> <laughs> um, And 57% knew about the state's budget deficit, which you know clearly was something that has been in the news. It's been consistently the case for many years, uh, for my students their whole lifetime, I think, pretty much. <laughs> um, and then only 17% knew that the state's uh, budget has gotten better in the last year, thanks to some propositions. So this is the thought last question on spending. And what we asked is, of the following choices, and what does your city or town spend the largest amount of money? Uh, and the options were public safety, food stamps, uh, Medi-Cal, or, or this one that we completely fabricated, uh, aid to other California cities, like more <laughs> aid, but for cities, right? Um, and then not sure. And so these are kind of interesting results. The, the correct one, in case you're wondering, is public safety. Uh, and a quarter of the population got that one right. Um, so you see a lot of confusion, right? So, so you know, the food stamps, Medi-Cal, aid to other cities is just misinformation. They, they sort of falsely believe that, it, you know, federal or state uh, responsibilities are responsibilities of the locality. But then for a full 41% admitted that they didn't know, which actually is amazing. You don't get that many um, don't know responses for most questions on surveys. Um, but 41% were just sort of willing to admit that they had no idea about what the spending is. So that gives us a good idea that people don't have a really broad understanding about what cities are doing, even what the responsibilities are. So here's, um, excuse me, let me go back. The local fiscal knowledge index, so that's the three local ones. 22% um, missed all three of them. 
44% got one of those three right, 28% got two of them right, and then 6% um, got all three right. So only 6%, no, the microphone's over here, that's maybe better. 6% uh, got all those right. And then when we do the overall fiscal index with all five of those, 12% missed all five, which is hard to do because it is multiple choice. <laughs> 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 And then you see this kind of a bell curve, but it's skewed to the lack of information side, right? Uh, only 1% got all of them correct. I was just, uh, you know, turning in my grades for the semester. And so if you wanted to do the math, the, the, the pass rate is right here. You can barely see that, huh? But at 3, that would be a D. Right? <laughs> and then, then anything to the right of that would be a passing grade. Below that would be uh, an F. So only about a, you know, a little, about a third of the, of the group would have passed um, on, on this sort of index. All right, so what are the patterns? We found, and this is a good piece of news, right, that more knowledge leads to more, leads to more engagement. Those two are associated with each other. So people who are more knowledgeable are more likely to um, contact the local officials, to vote, etc. More knowledge and also more engagement um, are associated with a small, you know, slightly associated with a preference for less spending. So we had those spending items earlier on. Um, and so the, these next two will sort of explain why that is. Um, so it looks like these two are in conflict. So more knowledge leads to a preference for higher taxes at the same time. So that overall in the sample, higher levels of knowledge are associated with higher levels of support <coughs> for increases in taxes. And the flip side is true, lower levels of knowledge for less on the taxes. So that seems like those who are in, in conflict. But the reason is that the, the higher knowledge is also associated with having a budget deficit in your city. And this makes sense if you think about the sort of fire alarm model, where people don't pay attention until something really goes wrong and suddenly they pay attention. <coughs> we had some cities in the sample that were, went bankrupt, uh, and that's something that you would notice, right? And they would start to pay attention to your local fiscal situation, and therefore your knowledge would increase. And so a lot of that um, knowledge and engagement associated with a preference for less spending probably has to do with the fact that people are in these cities in deficit, and of course if your city's in deficit, you will want uh, less spending. Also, when your city's in deficit, knowledge and engagement lead, lead to fiscal conservatism, right? So um, that probably makes a lot of logical sense that you want your city to spend less money if they've handled it poorly. Uh, that association is weaker when people are informed but not engaged. So people know uh, a little bit, but they're not actually participating. Maybe if you're upset enough, then you uh, it pushes you into participation and otherwise not. Um, and then it doesn't exist at all when people are engaged but not informed. So if people are engaged and not informed, they're not necessarily fiscally conservative. And then knowledge also, and this is also really good news, leads to logical consistency across the questions, uh, especially in deficits. So the trade-offs uh, and the spending priorities and the taxing priorities are logically consistent. And then we've got a couple of other patterns that are uh, aside from the knowledge. Um, engagement is associated with less logical attitudes among those living in, in deficit. So people in deficit cities um, who are engaged are not necessarily always logically engaged. So what that means probably is that there are some people who are still pushing for more spending even though their city can afford it at this particular point. Um, and then when your city is in deficit uh, and you're fiscally conservative, you're less likely to approve of your mayor and city council. That also makes a lot of logical sense, right? Uh, you're upset with those people. So there, there's a lot more detail here in the interest of time. Um, we haven't presented every detail, but it, we'd like to open it up for questions, if people have questions. Yes? When asking about public safety, did you define that term for them, or did you just take the general comment, police and fire, as well as the Yeah, it, it said like police. It said like yeah. police. So such, as. such as police or you know public safety like police. So it didn't, it didn't say fire in particular either. But it, we did get examples of each of those categories to get an idea. Yeah, we didn't want to put 
more than one. And at, at one point, the question was written uh, to say, such as fire and police, but then we thought, well, a lot of people might like firefighters, but not cops. And so we thought, well, we don't want to confuse people. So we gave one example for each of those categories. Describe any of this in terms of demographic breakdowns or locales in terms of is there differences in, in, that stand out in, in either direction? Or is this consistent across all those groups that you described? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of the demographics, uh, they're, they're not, there aren't any really strong patterns, right? In terms of differences according to, to race, ethnicity, gender, what have you. To our surprise, um, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, like it, it looks pretty much the same uh, across those different categories, with one exception. Uh, and we should have mentioned this before. Um, and this is not unusual with what one observes in other surveys and other parts of the country and whatever. Uh, Republicans are, on average, more knowledgeable about the, the items in, in the index, right? Republicans are more likely to know that the state was in deficit and that it got better. They're more likely to know what the tax rate is. They're more likely to know, et cetera. But keep in mind that every, like, you know, when I say more, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, if 1% if of Democrats know anything, you know, like 8% of Republicans do, right? So, I mean, the, the, the takeaway point from that portion here was how few of our citizens uh, actually know these pretty basic uh, types of budgetary and, and, and fiscal knowledge items. The Republicans did a little bit better. In terms of the, uh, the geographic breakdown, that's something that we have just started looking at, actually. Uh, to, at this point, we, we don't know. It's pretty fresh out the presses. Yeah. Um, one other minor pattern that I saw digging through it was um, if you broke out the preferences for spending by party, um, you didn't really see a difference between Democrats and Republicans, which is bizarre. Right. But where you did see a little bit of a difference was with independents. Um, and, and it was mo not on most of the items, but on the, uh, on the public pensions question. Independents were more likely to want less spending on the public pensions. Um, that was a significant association. And then also on, um, what was the last one? The uh, investment. Oh yeah, the business subsidies as well. And what I suspect is that we, we're starting to see some people who are sort of Tea Party um, conservatives who are uh, coming away from the party system and identifying as independents. And I suspect it, that those people explain that um, pattern. Could you just elaborate a little bit on um, how you're defining these terms, engagement and um, and participation? Sure. You want me to do that? Uh, and, and when we said, you know, because you know, we had all these different, you know, the different questions, right? But at the end of the day, if we're dichotomizing them and placing people in either the engaged category or the unengaged category, uh, we called someone in, engaged basically if they reported having voted and having contacted um, an official in the last year. So that's an engaged. And we we looked at stuff. You know, broken down too, but but like I said, if you want to you know, simplify it and say engaged or not engaged, we called those folks engaged. Um, you know, we also did some stuff where we 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 included the the uh, attentiveness in terms of uh, how often they're paying paying attention to the news, but but we wound up letting that go because we just felt like those those numbers were so inflated. And so engaged versus not engaged is is you voted and at least you said that you voted, and you said that you contacted the public official, because we thought theoretically, right, if the idea is, you know, if, if we're trying to understand how people placing pressure on their local public officials when it comes to either taxes or spending, you know, contacting your public official is a, is a big, big part of that. Um, did you want to know about uh, information as well? Yeah, informed. Yeah, yeah, informed. And then we had the, the five item index, but when we wound up just breaking it down and, and saying informed or not informed, we focused on the local, and uh, um, and so and also just because the, the numbers worked out that way, where it was a, a decent number, uh, you're informed if you got all three of the uh, the local information questions right. So you knew whether or not your your city or town was in deficit. You knew what the tax rate was. 
and you knew what was the spending one. Um, the, the prior, the, that it was a public money good. The public safety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, not that, you know, that. That's right. That's right. You actually <laughs> knew. Yeah, you you correctly knew that your that the most uh, expensive thing that your city spends money on is not Medi-Cal or food stamps <laughs> or aid to other cities. And so again, we, we tried to make that pretty, you know, a pretty low bar. And if you then got all three of those, we were calling you reasonably informed because if we tried to make it a higher bar, then, or nobody would be left. Yeah. That's 1%. Yeah, 1%. Yeah, right. Um, was your survey able to um, distinguish between somebody who wanted to increase spending in one area, cutting it in other areas, and cutting taxes? You see what I'm saying? That yeah. I, I want to spend more on police, but I want yeah. to cut on all other areas, and I, we can also have a tax cut and still balance the budget. Yeah, we can do that. We, we haven't looked at that yet, but we can do that. Because we can look at those individual spending items and see where people want to <coughs> increase or cut. I noticed you said you called it completely illogical at one point. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They were wanting to spend more. <coughs> actually, the, actually tax, the, and to cut taxes. And I well, that maybe it could, they could have been actually logical if they're wanting to spend less on some things, but spend more on the one item that you asked. Well, yeah. And another thing too is that we uh, uh, we actually didn't call. People, we should have elaborated that. We we didn't label someone as illogical. Um, and this is shorthand on here, but uh, we label someone as illogical if they first said that they preferred budget balance on both like over taxes and over more spending and then they said in the separate questions later said that their taxes were too high and said that we should increase spending on on balance um, and then we also we doubled down then and, and looked at, at that whether people were living in a city or town that was in deficit or not and so we because we figured even there you know if the if the city's flush with cash and you want to lower taxes and increase spending, it still wouldn't make sense that you said that you wanted to balance the budget. But still, you know, like maybe that's not so illogical. Um, but when people are living in a city or town that's in deficit, and they say they want to balance the budget, but then they say, hey, my taxes are too high and um, we should increase spending, that was illogical. Yeah. <coughs> So when you're asking the question about taxes, it's understood that that's across the board. So if someone replies with, my taxes are too high, there's a chance that they're pulling from Fed, state, well, local. Well, the, the question was phrased, local taxes. Oh, okay. actually local sales taxes. Local sales taxes. Also, it was phrased. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because we were, we, we played with that. Again, we are trying to figure out, you know, we didn't want to even say just local taxes because that could be vague. Like people have different ideas about what con yeah what totally constitutes a tax or whatever, and so we thought the one thing that everybody will will definitely sort of understand and, and be able to relate to is the local sales tax. So that's specifically what we were asking. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it when you did ask that question, I think you said forty one percent of the respondents <coughs> the local sales taxes are too high, and and if I remember the presentation. You thought, well, that wasn't so bad. But in a state that requires two-thirds voter approval yeah. to raise a tax, 41% right. who say it's too high <coughs> more than the 34% it takes to block it. And so right. that may be a, not, not quite so optimistic for, you know, tax and spend liberals. Good point. <laughs> and, and again, the, the other side of that, too, um, was that I think it was what? Four percent or something said that they actually were too low. That too they were low. too low. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Wait, I think she. Yeah. Didn't, didn't you have yeah. I'm just curious. Under state law, cities are required to adopt a balanced budget right. each fiscal right. year. Right. So how did you explain to folks what a deficit meant versus, you know, being flush or being balanced? Yeah. We didn't explain it. Uh, we just, you know, asked them whether it was, it was just very simple. Uh, when, when you're thinking about your city or town's um, budget last year, would you say they were um, in surplus or, or in balance or in, or in deficit? So then, in terms of your judgment calls, how did you determine then? Yeah, we just, we just looked it up and, and saw, because, you know, 
that provision is, is accurate, but it's still the case that in, in, in many cities or towns, there actually was a deficit, right? That, that, so, so we just looked up um, expenditures minus revenues uh, for the end of the fiscal year in, in 2012. Uh, now, there were plenty of places who, uh, whose expenditures exceeded their revenues um, at the end of 2012, but they had had surpluses prior to that, and so overall they weren't in debt, right? But we then focused on just the, the annual deficit. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it seems like in your presentation you acknowledge, but it is well understood, that there's a very low turnout for, for um, local elections. Um, I don't know what it is in Sacramento County, let's say, 20-25%, let's say. Um, I think it, traditionally in such surveys, people that don't vote are treated as irrelevant, let's say, to, to whatever political sphere we're talking about. It seems in your survey, you're treating people that don't vote as relevant in, in your presentation of, of by default, you're treating them as, as relevant to, to um, local politics. Right. I mean, if we if we cut cut it just to the people who said that they voted, we might have some some different sort of outcomes. But that yeah, there have been statewide surveys that look at that and find that there are differentials between non-voters and voters in terms of their preferences for what they would um, like to see on spending. That basically the non-voters want more social spending. They tend to be lower income, lower education level, etc. Um, but as far as roll-off numbers. You know, we could separately calculate that. So, I mean, what I mean by that is the number of people who show up to vote but only vote the top of the ticket, you know, the presidential race or uh, maybe a few initiatives but don't bother with the state level races. We don't have a way to um, get at that with these data. That would be really interesting yeah. if we saw, you know, what were the people who act they, they reported that they voted. The yeah. question was phrased voting in the local election, but, you know, clearly that, that may not be um, exactly what they were reporting. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, the, part of the reason why we're trying, looking at everybody is part of what we're trying to understand is the difference between those who are engaged versus not and how that mixed with the, the information to, to produce different patterns. And so if we exclude the non-voters, then we can't address our research question. You know. Yes. Did you find any trends in the level of knowledge or engagement, um, whether the respondents were rural, suburban, or urban dwellers? Did you look at that? That's a great That's a question. question. That's one of the things that, as Kim said earlier, this is still pretty hot off the presses, and that's still on our, our list of things that we're looking at. That's a great question. Yeah, Ted? Um, I want to go back to Debbie's point. I do think on the, on the, on the knowledge question, yeah. there, there is a sense that what's a wronger answer, and uh, it is possible, on, or it would be possible for someone to say, my city is not in deficit because they know that they had a carryover, oh. and, and that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, the food stamps and Medicaid, yeah. that's yeah, just right. wrong. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, forgot to, I forgot to mention, actually, that it wasn't, if somebody said that their, their town was in deficit, um, that was only counted as correct if, if both if there was an annual deficit in terms of the revenues and expenditures, and it, it car there, there was a carryover, right? So, so it had to be both things. But yeah, there's definitely a wrong or answer, and that was part of the reason why we we included that one item because we just wanted to see, you know, how ridiculous we could make it. You know, want to see, you know, how many folks think that, and because again, we're not asking whether or not your city or town spends any money on Medi-Cal food stamps or whatever thing. You know, if somebody said that, that's one thing. These folks are saying that that is the biggest expenditure. Right. You know, to aid to other cities is, is <laughs> what we're spending. You know, so. Yes, sir. So I think misinformation is just as important as information. More important, I would, I think we would yeah, go with those. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The question is, when you throw out the data on yeah. the misinformation, misknowledge or lack of yeah. accuracy, the business education, which demonstrates that we're not doing a good job, right? But the point is that the issue here is that, you know, why not keep that information in the, in the data set 
and analyze using that information. I mean, and also perhaps if you have the ability to relate this data to real cities, if you if you if you have information as to the respondent's locale, and one could ask we do. whether or not the person really represents this company city that is is or is not in whatever those categories are. We do. Yes, we do. Yeah, we did do that. So, um, so you're um, able to determine whether or not, for example, that city is in fact in fact in quote unquote whatever right. it means. Yeah, yeah, that's how we measure. That, that was one of our yeah information. And the, the misinformation. I mean, yeah. obviously, I'm really interested in those questions. Right. Um, we don't have a ton in this survey that we can use that's misinformation. We do on the, the Medicare one. Uh, there are a couple of questions. That's one of the next steps, I think, is to look at what, what the patterns are with the, the misinformation. Yes, but, you know, right. I mean, we only had so many questions, so we couldn't, we couldn't ask like 10 misinformation questions. Right, but we're really interested in that. I mean, that was one of our, our motivations, and, and we'd like to separate again on that one item. You know, there's the 41% who said that they just didn't know. And so again, we can classify those folks as uninformed, but the folks who said that, that the thing that the city is spending the most money on is either Medi-Cal, food stamps, or aid to other cities, those are the misinformed. And it, and it will be interesting to, to compare the, the uninformed versus the misinformed and see what those patterns look like. And we just have And we can, we can also do that with the um, sales tax rate, if they're oh, right. really on the, on the yeah. extremes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I'm sorry, did you say that the respondents were Yeah, we can't we can't say that because there wasn't enough. Um, you know, with with 30 cities, you know, you're talking about around 30 respondents in, in each city, which you know is <coughs> enough to be able to say that they're really representative. What's the range of cities that you had? What was the smallest city you found? Oh gosh, do you remember that, Michael? I don't remember the smallest. Um, we had Los Angeles in there. Yeah, so LA was in there, so that's the biggest. <laughs> um, I mean, basically, like, did it, because somebody asked earlier about, you know, the great company to rural or, right. Or, right, like, are we actually, is this actually capturing any? Yeah, but there's, there's variance all the way across. I mean, we have very small towns uh, in there, and then we have, and that, because that was one of the things that we, one of, the, one of our selection criteria was to make sure that we had the smallest of towns, medium-sized uh, cities, and then a big city or two. Um, and I just can't remember the exact population numbers for the smallest town, but I mean, very, you know, very small. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I don't know if you captured information, but if there's any variation between city councils that are general representatives versus those that are broken up by district and engagement levels or knowledge. It's a great question. We talked about that. Uh, we we ran out of space on the survey, <laughs> but and we, and we could retroactively. We could look actually, at that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we do have the city. Yeah, so we can figure yeah. out which which one that is. So that'll be another next step. Thank you. On, on geographic yeah. regions, you said you, you sorted them by, I think, four regions? Yeah. Um, is that regional sorting consistent with what other survey institutes, survey organizations use for their EIC <coughs> sorts by the same four regions or fields? I, I think. You? Field often does a breakdown that's even simpler than that, where they'll do a coastal versus inland. Right. Um, so we have actually, you know, more more options than that. We have a northern, southern, and coastal inland uh, divide. Um, PPIC, you know, it's it, yes, I, I think in general it's consistent or even a little bit better. I mean, obviously you could have finer gradations that would yeah. be possible, um, but we needed to get, you know, a decent sample size. If, if you right. use the same uh, geographic sorting as, as other statewide surveys, wouldn't that begin to suggest comparing surveys or? If, if those other surveys asked any questions like this, which they don't typically. But that was one of the things that was, was uh, interesting about this, this project to me is um, how little research is out there on people's attitudes towards local fiscal matters. I mean, there's very, very, very little on that. Yeah, field and PPIC tend to focus on statewide issues. Yeah, state stuff. Yeah, we have like times to them. Yeah, they did one. And the field did one too. But, you know, I don't get much academic literature at all. No. Yeah. We've got time for one more question. Charles, you've got it. Uh, well, just a uh, comment as you go forward and think. I mean, I had a couple reactions to your 
discussion of the pension and why people did not want it. And there was much damage to it, as, as you might have expected. And one is, frequently you look at the number of people who actually work for government. And so whether it's federal, state, or local, concern about public pensions can be a and when you do ask the question, you have to also ask, does any member of your family? Because a lot of people, even if they know that their parents did, right. Right. they don't want those pensions cut because that's going to end up on them. Yeah. Uh, and the other, the other piece was about the role of independence. If you think about the way politics works, both Democrats and Republicans have motivations to get into government to work, uh, whereas independents theoretically don't. So. Those, are, those are good observations. Very good points. If we'd had another hundred questions, we right. could <laughs> I think at one point we were asking people whether or not um, uh, anybody in their uh, family worked for government. Did yeah. that, that one got oh cut though, gosh. didn't it? Yeah. We, we started off with that one, but we cut it off. Okay, well, thank you, David and Kim, for their. Citizen 
to do what the public sector official wants. <laughs> right? It's this kind of beginning with the end in mind. We know what the answer is on this budget or land use or public safety or water issue. If we just gather the public together and let them know our brilliance, they'll obviously come to the correct conclusion. The other is what I call the community organizing model, and it was espoused best by uh, the late, and many would argue, great community organizer Saul Alinsky. Alinsky once said, if your army is large enough, parade them in front of the enemy to demonstrate your power. And if your army is not large enough, make sure you bring lots of pots and pans. It's this confrontational style of civic engagement it goes by community engagement, many terms, grassroots, community-based organizations, but nonetheless, it can also be very, not only confrontational, but leading towards a specific policy outcome. What I want to do is very briefly introduce some very new survey research uh, that we have conducted with the Institute for Local Government. Uh, it was led by the firm Public Agenda, and it was commissioned by the James Irvine Foundation to look at public sector official views. These are the results of over 900 surveys and focus groups conducted around the state last year, and these are some uh, data points that uh, have resulted on questions around views on public engagement. So this is what I would call the good results. 85% of respondents say, quote, their views on public engagement have changed since their careers began. Now, the average term of service for those surveyed, and these were both municipal, city, and county officials from throughout the state, uh, was 22 years. So with that 22-year average ter uh, term of service, 85% said their views of public engagement have changed. 70% of respondents thought the public should be involved in difficult budget <coughs> and service prioritization decisions. And now the bad and the ugly. 76% say their public meetings are, quote, typically dominated by and with narrow interests and agendas. 64% say their public hearings, quote, typically attract complainers and professional citizens. 69% say a, quote, lack of resources and staff could stand in the way of a deliberative public engagement approach. And this last data point I just pulled from a, um, some work that PPIC has done recently, 20% of California voters say they understand uh, little about their, the construction and development of their state and local budgets. So this constitutes what I call the public engagement trilemma for public sector officials. On one hand, you have public sector officials that understand that they need to engage the public. On the second part, they really don't like the public they have to engage. And on the third part, they understand that they may not have the skills, capacities, or abilities to actually lead an effective public process. But I think there are, uh, with these challenges, there are what we're seeing around the state as opportunities. Uh, first, rarely do municipal officials that we've consulted with and trained think through how the results <coughs> of public processes can actually be incorporated into the decisions. This sounds like a very simple point, but especially when it comes to the uh, public processes around budgets, very rarely do we see public sector officials take a, an initial step back to say, not only do we need to communicate about the budget, but if we're going to do so in a public scenario, are we prepared as a council or staff to actually do something with this feedback? Secondly, increasing awareness that our public comment processes actually predispose confrontation and a lack of deliberation. Three minutes at a microphone does not an effective deliberation make. In fact, we've done some recent work uh, with uh, some folks up at, in Humboldt State using brain science looking at how these three minutes on a microphone processes actually elicit confrontational behavior and a posture on the part of the public that we invite into this scenario. So if the understanding of our sum total of public processes is three minutes on a microphone, we should not be surprised at some of the results that we get. But third, and I think this is really one of the interesting uh, opportunities that's growing, is that, that technology especially data visualization, is making communication about budgets a lot easier. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at uh, the work 
in uh, Palo Alto and a few other cities, if you Google open, data, open budget Palo Alto, uh, increasingly technology is, is removing budgets from that very ugly and thick three ring binder of printed out Excel spreadsheets into formats that not only the public can understand but actually interact with. And I think increasingly as we talk about what the public does or doesn't know, we have to look at how the public has been informed over these years as it relates to budgets, and there are opportunities to improve that dramatically. So.
this is just a, to give you a sense of what's happening out there. Um, a little bit of a complicated slide, but the red shows you what the, what's happening with the condition of our roads. In fact, it's accelerated beyond when this slide was produced to where we've gone from a linear deterioration to an exponential curve in terms of the deterioration of our county roads. We are literally examining converting roads back to gravel. We are literally examining, we have a man's roads, we're, we're doing that actively now. And, that's the state, and, and the rest of our roads are worsening in accordance with that red line. And that's where, that's where we find ourselves today. The, uh, the blue line tells you what would be needed dollar wise to bring the roads back up to an acceptable level of condition. 96 million in the current year, and then it extends out from there. And that's not something we can solve on our bare bones 10% of the property tax dollar at this point in the This shows you what's happening. Vehicle miles are, are increasing. So the public is, is increasing their time spent on county roads. Their perception of county roads is accurate. They know the county roads are deteriorating. They know there are more potholes, but their perception of the fiscal situation is not accurate. They assume that there is a lot more discretionary revenue coming to the county than there is. And in some cases, if they live in the city, they may not have, they, they then now may be confused in terms of who even provides the service, whether it's the city or the county, and where the dollar, the property tax, or their sales tax dollar is going. That's enough of the negative news. <laughs> Let me talk about some positive things that are happening that, that really go to the presentation you just heard. Humboldt County, over the course of the last year, has begun to engage their public in there, and they've done it before. But last year, has used technology, as you heard, to engage the public in their budgeting process, and they went so far as to do a set of video conference uh, meetings throughout the county, so that people didn't have to travel to the county seat in order to participate in the meeting. And it was two-way, so that they could have two-way participation, depending on the work. I think they had five locations set up. The response, and I talked to the CEO about it, was that people responded very positively, the public did, to the idea that they were going out to their community providing a two-way forum for them to participate. So maybe that's one way of helping to increase education and participation in terms of the budgeting process. But another one that I find even more exciting is what's happening in San Mateo County, and this is straight from their website, and essentially they have set up a process for the public to bring ideas to the county to, to, through social media to uh, develop a, a network of people who are interested in that idea and who can stay informed about that idea and can watch that idea travel forward as a critical mass is reached, perhaps, and the county begins to examine the feasibility of it. So I'm, I'm pretty enthused by that. I, I want to follow it and understand it. I would certainly echo the theme that was in the previous presentation, though, that we are limited right now. We feel very limited by resources in terms of our ability to engage in something like this right now, because we don't want to put it up there and then not have the time and resources to actually effectively use it. And that's the challenge we face as we watch these other counties do it. Is we want to do it. We just want to make sure we can do it right and be able to effectively do it. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that opportunity to engage in new styles of, of conversations that uh, maybe is a good setup then for, uh, for the council member. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very used to when I tell people I'm a council member from Stockton, eyebrows shoot up. <laughs> so I will have a lot of the war stories for you today. Um, I really do believe that civic engagement is, uh, is critically important to good government and to getting sound fiscal policies. Um, without it, decisions are made and contracts get entered into that can financially ruin a municipality and Stockton is a prime example of that. When you hear about our staggering numbers, $417 million unfunded liability for retiree health care, $319 million long-term indebtedness, much of it, variable rates, most people respond with, wasn't anybody paying attention? And the simple answer is, to a large extent, no. Nobody was. Um, details of labor contracts were not fully or publicly disclosed. Councils found it much easier to say yes than to say no. Downtown redevelopment was exciting, and the housing boom had tons of money flowing into city coffers, and it made all those expensive projects seem very doable. And everybody got caught up in the national praise that these good times were just going to keep on rolling. Well, the Great Recession hit, and we all found out that the good times were over. 
my council closed more than $90 million in budget shortfalls in three years. That's a direct reduction in services to the people that live in the city of Stockton. But even that wasn't enough. And last June, Stockton became uh, the largest California municipality to enter bankruptcy. And at the time, the largest city in nationwide to go into bankruptcy. So we're here today to talk about what happens if you do engage the public, and is there a positive influence or impact on municipal finances and local government. And in Stockton's case, I have to say yes, there is a very beneficial impact. Uh, I was elected in 2008 uh, and took office in early 2009 with a, a new council that had no part of uh, previous decisions. And uh, we started the job of putting our fiscal house in order. That's the way we put it to the public. But the two most impactful decisions we made early on were we were going to air all our financial findings publicly. We were going to embrace transparency and take the public along with us step by step as we uncovered the real nature of our finances. And the second thing was we made the decision to put a charter amendment uh, on the ballot in November of 2010. Our Measure H was written to remove some special protections and benefits, including binding arbitration, which only our fire department enjoyed. There's a lot of reasons why this was necessary, but the main one was that just the threat of that binding arbitration was protecting minimum staffing requirements which had been added into their labor contracts. And it had resulted in absolutely runaway costs for the fire department. They were over budget by millions every year but one for a 10 year period. The prevailing attitude at the time was that the council was crazy to try and take on firefighters. But we really believed that if we gave the public the truth, the real numbers, um, that they would respond with support. So this sounds good, right? I mean, this is what we all want. We're going to engage the public. We're going to give them the Abraham Lincoln. We're going to give them the truth. Well, I took the lead for the council, and I appeared at at least a half dozen, essentially every election forum that fall. And every time I was facing off with two young, strong, attractive firefighters. <laughs> and it was me. And this is the kind of truth that I had to stand up there and say publicly to the people of my city. In 2009, do you know that the average firefighter cost you $188,000 a year in salary and benefits for 10 scheduled days a month? And I am not exaggerating when I say that every time I said that, there would be an audible gasp in the room. This is in a city where the per capita annual income is less than $20,000 a year. They had no idea. And then I had to tell them, and our firefighters pay nothing for health care for their entire family. They pay nothing towards their pensions. And they can retire at 50 with 90% or more of what they earned when they were working. And people were absolutely stunned. They had no idea what they were actually paying for their public employees. But I have to tell you, these are very, very hard truths to say publicly, to tell people. Three weeks before the election, the fire union had at least 30 firefighters walking precincts every single day. The no on eight yard signs outnumbered ours at least 10 to 1, and they outspent us 10 to 1. And on election day, we beat them by five points. And I honestly believe that it's because we had the guts to put the real truth out there, and nobody had ever done that before, <coughs> certainly not since 9-11. That truth had not come out to the public. Peter originally asked me to talk about how listening to public comments um, informed our decision to enter bankruptcy. And I wish I could tell you that Measure H earned us the trust of the public and they were right there with us every step along the way. But despite three years of full disclosure, communication, and honesty with the public, 
Our decision to enter Chapter 9 last June was met with a lot of continued public denial and criticism. And last November, the mayor and two of my fellow council members were swept. They lost their bids for re-election. I'm the only incumbent that was re-elected, even though we had enacted all of the fiscal reforms that we had promised and that the public was demanding. We'd lowered our compensation. We had second tiers. We, our, our employees are now paying market sh their fair share into their health care. They're paying their full portion for their pensions. All of those things we'd accomplished. But the public was angry, and, and they, there was a price to be paid. But I still believe in open and accountable government. And I really believe that a big part of why I survived the election is because I was the council member most identified with getting out there in the public and putting the facts out there and speaking the truth no matter how ugly it was. So I think to a certain extent, even when the public didn't like what I was saying, they did believe that I was telling them the truth. And today in Stockton, we have a much more engaged community. Uh, we just finished two nights of, of budget study session, and there was a lot of people coming, and they're asking a lot of hard questions that keep all of us really on our toes. For me, it's going to be really interesting to see if that level, that increased level of civic engagement will continue after we're no longer in crisis mode. I really hope that it does, because I do think we make better decisions when everything is aired publicly, but it still remains to be seen. There are still a lot of people that just don't, they want the truth, but only if it's good news. They really don't want the bad news. So that's our challenge, but we, we still need to do it, because in the end, I honestly believe we get the government we deserve, and it, it needs to be a two-way street, and we do need to put the truth out there. Thanks. Doesn't well, like bankruptcy to focus your attention. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was an interesting remark that Kathy made about the the costs of supporting public employees, and certainly the pension costs. Uh, that's something that that Marsha has worked on and thought about quite a lot. And so I'm really interested in the presentation. Thanks. Marcia. Yeah, who was it that said never waste a crisis, a good yeah. crisis? Um, I, just for a little background, I, I, I'm actually the current president of the California Foundation. Yeah, but I'm, a, but, but I'm an inactive CPA. I'm no longer actively practicing in, as a CPA. So that might have been a confusion. Um, we, the, the California Foundation for Fiscal Responsibility is a <coughs> 1C3. We educate, research, litigate. Uh, we are, we don't technically lobby, but we do a lot of exposure of facts that have a lot of profound impact. Um, and we were the ones that came out with the $100,000 pension club, mainly to get people engaged. It was really worked much better than we even anticipated. Um, during the gubernatorial election, I worked with advising um, top advisors for both the gubernatorial candidates, uh, Brown and Meg Whitman. Um, I worked very hard to make it uh, an issue during the campaign because the best way to get information out is to have two candidates sparring with each other over the same issue, and that worked really well. I gave uh, Governor Brown probably one of his best uh, statements during, during the debate. I said, you know, you're the poster child for pension reform because you're no longer, re you're not retired. And so he used that. He said, if everybody worked as long as I would, we'd be 50% over so, um, And we also, and so Brown was, uh, was elected and we witnessed a perfect model for uh, managing taxpayer expectations with revenue reality last fall using pensions to get there. Uh, Governor Brown knew from polling that pension reform was very, very popular. He also knew, and I agreed with him, that pension reform legally, in order to do anything, isn't going to really kick in for quite a few years after you get uh, this, this statewide uniform second tier, which we got with AB 340. And we all knew it. Um, so I said, well, you, you know, I don't think if you advertise to the tax 
taxpayers that you got pension reform that it's going to save, if you add in the county systems, $100 billion over 30 years, that they're going to not think you did something. So he used that, uh, that legislation then to get the business, the business uh, chambers of commerce behind them on a temporary tax increase because they understood that you had permanent pension reform, our bond ratings went up, it lowered our borrowing costs, a temporary tax increase sounds like a good deal, and it worked really, really well. That's a perfect example of meeting expectations uh, in order to get revenue reality to, to maintain the services that you want to <coughs> keep. Um, but in spite of pension reform, we're still you know, statewide, we're still going to have problems because it was a state increase. It, it didn't impact the local agencies. Last, uh, la in the last decade, the pension systems created what we call the easy payment plan for benefit increases and actuarial losses. They, they put everybody on a, on a low payment initial, actually negative amortization. And now that that funding policy that was adopted in the last decade is starting to kick in. So no matter what you're going to do as local agencies, that pension debt has to be paid and it's going to be a relentless increase. Um, so you've got to get your voters to understand what has gone on. And one of the things that I don't see enough attention being made to at the local level, when we say it costs 188000 for a firefighter, a lot of that cost, some of that cost, not a lot of it, but a, a pretty uh, material portion of that relates to current retirees. So you're right that it's 188000 because we, we pay our pension costs based on a percent of payroll, but that per, a, a, a portion of that percentage relates to existing retirees. And what I would definitely suggest and it's not easy to do, you probably have to work with your actuaries, is to get the facts on how much are we paying uh, for the, the debt related to current retirees that we can't touch. Um, and once you break that out, then the cost <coughs> per employee became, becomes a real number. They can't argue, yeah, that's really what it's costing me, once you take out the, the retiree costs. And you'll get the employees kind of agreeing with you rather than saying you're using funny numbers. And what it also does is it puts the government and the taxpayers on the same plateau to handle this elephant in the room, which is the debt related to the current retirees because we didn't pay enough in the prior years to handle it. We should have had the money set, set aside today. In fact, with the markets the way they are right now, the thing that really bothers me, with the markets where they are right now, we, we're, they're, they're way up. Uh, we should be 100% funded, but we're not. We're, we're way less than that. So I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in the future. So, so that's one big thing I would suggest is start to whittle, to really be more succinct on your pension debt and how much of your cost is going with current retirees that you have no control over. And then you can ask the taxpayers to help you pay that down. There's nothing you can do with current employees to pay it down. And then re retain services. Uh, we, I think it, I think it would work. Um, but then beyond that, beyond that, uh, one thing you can do, and I think the Yolo County uh, example was perfect. Use pictures to explain to your voters what <coughs> their money is paying for. They like graphs and easy to understand. And then document your research. There's three kind of voters that we have. We've got those that believe everything you say those that don't believe anything you say, and then we've got those that want to believe, but they want to check it out. That want to believe and want to check it out and make sure it's right, that's the voter that influence, influences it. That's the knowledgeable voter. And what we did to get AB 340, some, some in our nonprofit C3, uh, to get AB 340 going in the right direction, we actually had a Pictionary campaign, and some of you might have been on our list. We, we sent, for 30 days, we sent pictures of facts to every legislator, every staff member, and decision makers, and to the media with pictures and stick figures. And we put a fact in, and then we referenced to a, to a research study, a page, and they could link to it. 
And we got, and, and we got, we actually got when we were a little late uh, getting the Pictionary out, we actually got calls, is it coming, or email, or, you know, I haven't seen today's Pictionary. They loved it. They love that. And your, and your voters shouldn't be any different. If you can show in pictures, really easy, and make sure it's right because you're going to have those fact-checking people out there that really influence your voters. So the more you can show in measurement and improvement and positive, and we're in this together, I think the more you can get movement on balancing the expectations with the revenue increase. Thank you. So it looks like these four panelists would probably agree with Thomas Jefferson. 1789, writing from Paris, is the, the American ambassador, he writes back to Richard Price in New England, and he says, Whenever people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. But whenever things get so far wrong, insert Stockton, so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied on to set them right. So I get to ask a couple questions to get this conversation going. You may want to turn on those microphones, then we're going to ask the, uh, the, the, the audience uh, here to engage you to it. But, Kathy, is that what made the difference with Proposition H? I mean, whether it was graphic information or maybe a Stockton version of Pictionary uh, or, or just simply being there at those six or eight public events, you being the face of the council, did that give you the 5% that you won by? That was part of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, as a as government, we couldn't actually campaign. We could only educate. But we did have um, a volunteer group step forward and... Um, a shadow group of uh, some sort? It was actually um, a lot of retired employees. Uh, uh, not from the fire department, yeah. of course. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we had a really good website. And we loaded the website with a lot of information. And we were really careful, just what you were saying, Marcia, we, we used always the most conservative, most defensible numbers uh, so that we couldn't be accused of, of inflating it. Exactly. And, 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 yeah. and I think the other thing, in, in all honesty, um, the fire department really overplayed their hand. They were, there were news reports, I mean, they were going out into retirement homes and uh, on the, under the guise of, um, fire safety meetings, and they were telling old people, well, you know, if this passes, when you guys call 911, there may not be a paramedic that can respond anymore. And, and in fact, their, their no on H signs in the background had like a lifeline and then a flat line on, I mean, very, and I think they overplayed their hands. They, they were so aggressive that um, I think they, they actually drove people to our website, I think, because people wanted to know, is that really going to happen? And so, so you, picking up on this and, and the different techniques that, that they use, and this was in the context of a formal electoral right. effort, so it may be a little bit different, but in the counseling and advising that you do with, with public officials, does that sound familiar? Is that the kind of approach? Well, the, the work that we're doing is usually not around a specific ballot measure. In fact, we often caution municipalities that we work with that if you're, if you know on council you're moving towards a parcel tax, yeah. don't have uh, something called a town meeting around the budget when everybody knows that the council is heading in that direction. Just don't do it. Call it an information session. It's not as if you shouldn't inform the public that this is the reason why council's made this decision. But we've seen so many municipalities get over their ski tips when they have called something, they've given something the air of a public process, when really people start showing up and they understand the case bank. So, so they're being essentially dishonest with their voters and their tax payers. Right. It, it's, it's the Daniel Patrick Moynihan model. Well, and I, and I would also say, that, I mean, to give the, you know, at least a little bit of deference to uh, elected officials in most cases, that sometimes they don't know. They, they don't know that there's something wrong with calling something a town meeting and having a facilitator and going through a process when really back behind them a decision has already been made. They really do see public engagement as really informing the public, kind of what I would call a 1.0 approach to government as opposed to a 
a 2.0. So, uh, you know, it's not always done with, uh, with malevolence. Uh, I think right. there really are a lot of folks in government that really think that, well, I've been elected to make this decision, but I at least want to let the public know, but I'm going to call it something that has an air of uh, participation in which they really can. I want to come back to that question of these newer techniques, or, or but, but first I want to ask Pat, because you've worked in a very rural county, Amador County. Uh, you were assistant city manager in one of the fastest growing suburbs in California, which was not necessarily a badge of honor to some of us. Um, <laughs> and, and, and now um, you're tackling um, a bunch of constraints in a what I'd argue is a medium-sized county that, uh, in a fiscal sense, is being punished for doing the right thing for land use. Different, three really different venues. Um, where do you see public officials being effective, and, and does that change by locality? I don't know that it changes by locality so much as the methods that, that local officials are using. So I think the, okay. the participatory style where, where local officials are welcoming public participation is one that makes it, uh, for one, a better solution, but also leaves some trust. It's well, is that more amateurish because it's rural and relatively smaller and politics are I think a little more intimate? easier than? in a smaller community where when you go to the restaurant, you're going to see five people you know, yeah. and you're going to have that conversation. Three and three of them. Yeah. Grove or Yolo is big enough that that doesn't happen all the time, so certainly it's easier. Okay. But I, I'm thinking of an example in Yolo County right now with Bigger County, but we are, we are following the interest-based approach to resolving a issue that could have a lot of community conflict is, is where our airport goes and what is the future of the airport. We could go in and say it's going to be X and have an educational forum. But what we're doing instead is we're backing up and we're going to do an interest-based approach to see what the community might want, what the pilots might want, what their interests are, and what sort of solution will best match those particular interests. I have no idea what the outcome will be. I'm excited because I think what that it will be something I probably can't even imagine. But it may be something that enjoys both pilot and community support, thus leading to the trust that we need to advance whatever that solution is. So why did you engage in this, this interest-based uh, uh, approach instead of saying, well, we've hired a consultant, there are three alternatives, uh, here they are, community, uh, what, do, what do you think? And then, as I think we'd all agree, then you get the Punch and Judy show, you know, of just interest groups smacking each other without <laughs> talking about their real issues. And I think it's from having seen the interest-based approach work. So who did it? Was it you? Was it the board? I advocated it to the board members who were part of the committee that worked with the airport, and they were willing to kind of let us try it and yeah. step back a little bit. And we now are doing that work and out meeting with the community and doing some initial uh, setting the stage for an interest-based discussion that would follow. And so far, uh, the community is reacting, I think, more positively to that than they did to the historic style, which was to come out and say, this is yeah. what we're going to do. It would be interesting to see if this uh, airport project really so, what you were doing, um, Marshall, what, a lot of what you're doing was really interest based. You weren't taking the side of the California professional firefighters, and you weren't taking the side of this taxpayers' league or you know some other thing. Um, that seems to be a very uncomfortable situation for a public interest organization. To, to be in. Well, uh, no, not, well, the polls showed that we were very popular, uh, that the issue was very popular, and yes, a, a lot of people didn't like the facts, um, uh, and we had to be very careful, and, I, and I've made some mistakes, and the minute I make a mistake, I will, I will say so immediately, because you have to understand, we're, a, we're a, a, an association of volunteers, we don't have access to everything, we do the best we can, and because I've got a CPA background, and was a former consultant at CalPERS, I, I felt more comfortable with information than the standard Joe. So, um, but, but by, by giving information as accurately as possible, making, make, and not being afraid to be wrong. Two human nature is we all want to be in control and we all want to be right. The minute you are okay with being wrong, you're probably over 50% of the way there to get a solution. If you're open to being wrong and okay with it and manage it and change because you've been given better information, you're going to, then the other person wants to be right, right? So you've got them on your side. It's a technique that we used over and over and over again. We tried to make our opponents correct. And, and I, we were open to, well, wow, I got to check it out. And then what am I missing here? 
they'd be right, you know. So that was that was really important for us. Yeah. So getting it right is certainly important. Um, what do you think? What do you want to ask them? And, and let me just put our researchers uh, on on the spot. Oh, <laughs> I brought someone out. Um, <laughs> in what you found, or what you're beginning to find as you unpack those data, and, and what these folks have done from four very different perspectives, what are the similarities, what seems to underscore and underline your research findings, and then what seems anomalous to you? Wow. Uh, does well, stand out I to mean, you? The, the part about the, uh, one, one of our findings was that in, in the cities in deficit, people are more informed, and that's probably because of efforts like that. Um, because city councils are forced into interacting more with mm -hmm. the population who realizes that there's a crisis. Right. So that, that certainly reinforces some of our data. Um, if I so crisis focuses attention. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in some sense, Tara has this microphone for you. So in some sense, the Stockton model, as, as deeply tragic as it is, the Stockton model really got people to pay attention in certainly ways they never had before and in ways you wish they had been attentive in, in the 90s and, and in the aughts. Right, and you know, the way this is playing out in Stockton, and, and it, it's hard to go back now and talk about Measure H because it was so contentious and, it, and, and only the fire department had that protection. And so mm -hmm. it focused everything on the fire department. And, um, and, and that really wasn't the issue. It wasn't about the firefighters. It was, uh, it was about money. It was about it's really money. what it was. And um, we have had a tremendous amount of engagement and focus at this point. And, you know, the comment that it's tragic, well, the reality for Stockton is we're probably going to have, uh, we've been in protection under Chapter 9 for um, not quite 12 months yet. The judge confirmed our eligibility. Um, we're going to have our plan of adjustment before the judge by the third quarter of this next, or the first quarter of this, Coming third year. quarter of this calendar year. Yeah. <laughs> so we're and we're looking at having um, eliminated already the savings in in labor going out is like two billion dollars over the next forty years. So. For us, yes, the, the tragedy is that we got to that point. But but what's been happening since then is um, because of the education, not just of the public, but the elected officials as well, um, Stockton is going to end up much healthier. And we are going to end up in a, in a better place and able to to go forward with uh, with recovery. And I don't think we could have done that if, if we hadn't have taken that step. Pete, were you leaning in to... You yeah, I was just going to add that we consulted this past year with the City of Bell in a uh, public budgeting process. <laughs> and uh, actually, it's not a joke. <laughs> um, but to the point about it takes a crisis, uh, this is a new way of not just acting as a leader, because it really did take a brand new council and a new city manager to even start, a, even conceive of a public budgeting process in that environment. But it takes a different way of being a citizen. And I think uh, more and more the municipalities are really dealing with these difficult budget situations. It's going to take a lot different approach, both from leadership, whether elected or staff, but certainly from citizens as well, not only to become informed, but as we've seen in Bell and certainly some other municipalities that we've worked in, that the way that services are going to be delivered, it's going to be a different thing. And it may involve citizen, direct citizen participation in doing that. Or it may be at least understanding that uh, services are going to be delivered in a different way by different uh, collaborations of organizations. Bell, Bell Gardens, uh, Southgate, Compton to some extent are, are, are known in, in the 626 area code as the gateway cities. That's the polite. My grandmother used to belong to the Gateway Cities Credit Union, which she lived in, in Compton. And um, it was former um, Ventura City Manager Rick Cole, the former yeah. mayor, elected mayor of, of Pasadena, who did a, I think it was an op-ed piece in the LA, LA Times saying, well, wait a minute, part of the problem here is the lack of engagement, right. that uh, particularly in areas where people are not eligible to vote because of citizenship or age or uh, disability or some other reason, you have a very low formal 
engagement, right? So this is the difference between voters and taxpayers. Very low formal engagement, that seems to be an institutional problem, a structural problem, as opposed to sort of a structural response, as opposed to a process problem that, that you've been talking about. Well, I, this is a terrible answer, but it's really both, right? It, 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 does, take, it does take leadership, and there couldn't be a, a, a more of a... a leadership <laughs> from the elected officials? Yes, from elected officials okay. and staff. Okay. Yeah, these are significant administrative pieces to this. So that's not off the hook on this. <laughs> no, he, doesn't, he looks like he's putting himself on the hook yeah. by the work that he's doing. Right. But it takes the city managers, finance directors, to, be, to want to open up these books. Uh, but at the same time, it does take citizens. It is a great responsibility on them. And this, but this is what I've seen in Bell. That for a lot of people, and I love Rick, Rick's a friend of mine, and that, that op-ed that you were mentioning in the LA Times was essentially advocating for a, essentially a conglomeration, a consolidation of those gateway cities. Uh, when you go into Bell, <laughs> Bell knows it's Bell. You know, and Bell and wants not Bell to Gardens, stay, thank you. No, or Maywood. Or Cudahy. Or right. Right. Bell wants to stay Bell. It's got its own history, it's got its own school system, it's got its own way of being. Mm -hmm. And they're doing everything they can now. Now, uh, to defend that, um, I was just in a panel yesterday with the current mayor pro tem for the city of Bell, and we're not exactly sure there's going to be a city of Bell this time next year. Things are still very tough there. But with better leadership and citizen engagement, and Rick was absolutely right to point out that being an important part, this isn't... You know, so you need this critical mass of engaged people. Yes, you do. Yeah. I'm hugging the microphone. Who has questions for these guys? I want to say to sort of piggyback on that, I think it's important too for the public to understand their role in this because at the local level, most city councils are made up of part-time people who hold full-time jobs somewhere else or are retired, but a high percentage have full-time jobs elsewhere. They have absolutely no experience in municipal finance or anything else that a city does. And the public elects people based on not necessarily their real qualifications. It's based on their charisma or who they know or who's going to promise to get a park in their neighborhood or whatever. And so it is a two-way street because local level, I mean, that's where the rubber hits the road. And you have people elected that are making multi-million dollar decisions, they don't, sometimes your electives don't have a clue about how the money pot is split up. And we don't know if it's a county road that that road is split Exactly. Yeah. That's right. You, you've been talking about municipalities and, and, and counties, but the problem becomes even more acute when you're talking about special districts. A significant portion of the California population do receive municipal services through uh, through a small special district uh, or large special districts, depending really on, on, on the, the area. Uh, in Eldorado the County, there's about 49 independent special districts that provide uh, some type of public service. And 22 of those districts probably should not be in existence. They're too small for uh, supporting um, enough services to generate enough revenues to support services. They're too small to have a healthy body politics so you would have a healthy turnover of elected officials and they're too small to even support staff so you're talking about part-timers who are serving on, on, on city councils uh, these are quarter-timers serving full-time on a special district board and they have to do the job of, of staff people because they don't have any um, so the engagement of, of public participation becomes this is what the interest of, for us is because we do have two types of special districts. So the 22 that I said should not be in existence, they fall into one or two categories. The uh, elected officials know that this is this district and they don't want to go away or consolidate with somebody else. Um, but the residents don't care. Or you have the elected officials realizing that yes, this district should go away, uh, but it's their, it's their residents who, want it, who don't want it to go. And uh, I'd be curious to have your thoughts about what happens with uh, trying to engage or how to more, more effectively engage people who live in a special district who don't even realize that they're in a special district. Well, 
Well, we've actually done some work with the California Special Districts Association. Um, I've, we, I've also cons consulted on some projects with special districts, but by and large, they've been ones that people understand, like the water district. Um, you're right to say, on top of not knowing whether we're on a county road or a local road, we're not exactly sure where some of our services are coming from. And uh, you did show that graphic up there with the, with the sales tax dollar to show that some of those monies are going towards special districts. So, you know, this is a, uh, but you, but I think what you're raising is, is another question around the possibility of consolidation more generally. And the fact that generally those kinds of pro, uh, public engagement processes are not going to be convened by the special district themselves because they're so interested. And for uh, completely understandable reasons. And so it really does, it would take uh, others to convene that conversation, but they still have institutional power. So Jose didn't tell you, but he is the executive officer of the El Dorado LAFCO, the entity that, that the legislature has charged with raising that question, but yeah. your commissioners, who are local elected officials, may not want you raising those questions. Marcia, you, you've raised, the, you've raised the, the pension question and the knowledge question at very clearly at a very high statewide level and engaged with, with some cities and counties as well. Do you bump into it with special districts? Yeah, actually I did. Uh, Recently, I got, I, I, I don't want to use, this is on camera. Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of brought in late to comment on a proposed merger in, um, in, a, in a city in the Bay Area of a fire district. There were, there were one fire station with a county fire district. Mm -hmm. um, on the surface, it made a lot of difference. But looking at it, my analysis was that the reason they wanted to merge is they were going to get a substantial increase in overall pay and benefits, and it, and it was married with a tax transfer. And I came in to try to explain it in a debate uh, where, from the, the best I could, where why this wasn't in the interest of the of the current residents. The long term yeah. cost so, increase. So, but, but it ended up passing overwhelmingly because because of the union wanting yeah. to get more pay and benefits with if they merge. Um, and uh, so so that so they weren't given the right information now that the truth is sinking in to, to them. And it's gonna backlash. Unfortunately it's gonna backlash because you, then you've got the people that want to believe but but they now feel like they've been disengaged. Any kind of merger attempt is going to be horrible in that in that area. So you've got to be really accurate with the savings and, and make it real simple and honest. Okay. Good advice. There we go. Uh, Tara's got a, a microphone for you there. Hi, I, I'm at this uh, uh, seminar in uh, local government in California, citizen engagement. Um, deficits, and I haven't heard the third rail mentioned once. Uh, so as an academic, I'm going to bring up property taxes, property taxation, and the relationship that that has had in California, you know, in the lack of citizen engagement, especially in the ability of why go to a city council meeting, or why go to a, a, a special district or, or a school board, you know, we don't have the ability to propose a revenue increase, right? It's kind of you know, shifting chairs around on the Titanic. Um, uh, you know, I, I think people will be much more engaged if they have this ability to propose a, a property tax increase or some type of revenue increase, which you don't have in California, a local revenue increase, and then hold the, the government accountable, you know, elected officials accountable for it. So I wonder if you would comment at all on that, you know, whether this is unique uh, when we have this environment where it's difficult to raise local revenue. Let, let's start with Pat, because it was his slide that probably be, began to prompt that sort of question. Well, I can tell you that my colleagues in other states often fear coming to California or taking a job in California because they can't imagine a scenario where you're running an operation where you can't raise revenues to match your capital improvement plan or your expenditure plan. And that's how they see it in California. They just, they're, they're incredulous about how do you run an operation that way where you have no control of your revenues and yet you have roads deteriorating when you do a capital improvement plan. Locally, Yolo County is the second is the second lowest property tax share in the state. I came from Amaro County, which got 32%. Amador County had a lot more flexibility in its general fund and put almost a million dollars a year of general fund in the roads. Can't do that in Yolo County. And so what you have is a series of counties and cities as well, but the counties are what I'm familiar with, where there are discrepancies. Our roads are going to be worse than Amador County's roads. Our roads are going to be worse than Marin County's roads, who's putting, I think, five million or six million general fund in, or Sonoma. 
Shelby County who's putting in an equivalent amount of general fund. It's just a fact, a legacy of Prop 13. That's where we sit. Where did, yeah. I, where did I read that somebody's airbag deployed because they went into a pothole? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. and, laughs> <you know. laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it was so <laughs> Kathy, did that, did that come up with you uh, in, in Stockton? Because uh, didn't you? Uh, council or somebody engaged the voters in a discussion over a sales tax increase. We, I mean, part so of our... So you can't do property tax you know, and but, your predecessors have committed all that other property tax increment to your redevelopment agencies, then you have to search for something new. Well, the dissolution of our redevelopment agency is actually costing our general fund now between one and two million dollars a year because of the shortfall in the tax increment. But, so the state's budget actions over the last few years definitely impacted right. us because we had a net loss of a, almost a million dollars a year with the VLF, loss of the VLF, and so there were a lot of different elements, but we probably, it hasn't come to council yet, but there's every likelihood that we will be putting a three-quarter cent general sales tax uh, on a special election in November, and so it will be all hands on deck. I mean, it's going to take all of us out there talking to the public, explaining why it needs to be a general tax, because we have to have some flexibility to provide for fiscal stabilization. Um, and quite frankly, our new mayor has been advocating since, uh, for a year, for a restricted tax, that uh, a half cent that would only be able to be used for um, police officers. Two thirds voter approval on that, uh, but your general only fifty, yeah, 50%. fifty plus. So we'll see how it works, but um, we will have a big job of of educating people because I will tell you in in our area when you ask about well would you support it if it was going to satisfy pension obligations? Uh huh. If it's going to debt. As long as it's not the lion's share, they're still there. As long as the majority is going to go to restore <coughs> services, they hang in there. And and we were up in the mid high sixties. Can I say something? Yeah. You know, actually, that's that's fine. We just all need to know what the real yes, the real number is. I agree. Um, voters like knowing where their dollars are going to go, I'm but totally don't. Agree. Don't pull the wool over their eyes. You've got to be really, you've got to deliver, you know, especially if it's a temporary tax increase mm -hmm. um, because they will, there will be a big backlash. Absolutely. <laughs> and the reality is some of that money will go to creditors. It will be used to pay off some of those debts. And you have to be honest about it because if you tell people it's not going to and then they find out later that, oh, well, that was part of that settlement to get out of bankruptcy. But part of that really is, and this is, the, this is the leadership piece. It really is about, to get back to the Lincoln quote, it is about trusting the voters yes. with the information, right? We were consulting on a public budgeting process with a central coast city that will remain nameless. Uh, and before, we were going to do a series of four budget workshops that had a $20 million deficit on a $100 million general fund. And uh, the news hit the local newspaper three days before the first budget workshop that they just hired a new police chief at about 275 grand. Mm -hmm. Now, guess what the number one issue was that the <laughs> 200 people were that showed up at that first budget workshop, right? So, we're paying this cop 275, 280 grand. That's obviously our problem. But then when you say, well, that's this much mm -hmm. of $20 million. Mm -hmm. So let's pay the police chief zero, and we're still 19.8 yes. away from getting to that number. And and it's only when you're in some sort of process like that, which again, if you had done it three minutes on a microphone, it just would have been one person right. after another saying, it's the cop, it's the cop, it's yes. the cop, it's the cop. Right. It, and so it, this is my pitch for it. The, it. Sometimes it's the process, stupid, in which you engage the public. Yes, they heard that, but then once they were able to relate that to the fuller budget picture, they really could be trusted to make some larger trade-off decisions. You know, what, what, was the second, what was the second meeting like? If that was the first meeting, 
when you did the second of four. Well, I would say actually that the better? rest of the three hours of yeah. that meeting itself, oh. that was the first half hour we had to get. Okay. We had to weather that storm. Okay. And then for the next three hours of the meeting, it was completely different. So by the time you got to the end, you weren't just talking about line items. The number one, and this is where budgets intersect with values that we've set, seen many times at the local level. The number one thing the residents wanted to protect or find a way to do was how can we keep our kids at home after they graduate from high school? How, how, can, how can the way that we do services and the relationship of our budget to services do that? And that's a completely different yeah, discussion. Than, than, it is. It's really different. But it, you know, there still are math problems that you need to solve. But, and, and again, if you're, if you're going to invite people into a dialogue as opposed to mon a series of monologues, it allows you to have a different we actually um, developed um, some software, and we started doing budget town hall meetings. This was back in 2010. And we developed this software so that we would put up the, the graph and show how the deficit was growing. And then people would stand up and say, well, what if you just just close the libraries? We don't even need the library. We need, to, we need yeah. police officers search. And it would show what that would do to the deficit. And what people came to understand is, if we closed every single office department in the entire city organization within 12 to 18 months, we would still be running a deficit again just based on police and fire. We were already spending over 80% of our discretionary dollars on police and fire. We have a question here for you. Um, as leaders in your community and as local officials and in your service to local officials, what techniques have you used or seen it to, to be really successful in engaging or convincing the, the public engagement skeptic, not in the community, but in your staff, kind of that mid-level staffer who's super resource stretched, has been beaten up, you know, they're not, they're not council members, they're implementing what council is saying or whether city manager is saying or, or county administrator, but but man, do they not want to? You know, they don't want to get out there. What? How do you how do you mobilize that staffer? Well, let, let's go to Pat. Yeah. He does. He's those are the people who work for him, right? Oh, I was hoping right. someone was going to answer the question because that's the challenge. Uh, <laughs> question you've been we, we face that challenge right now. Our board of supervisors has said they want to do more of that. We've been out working actually with the Sacramento State uh, Watchers Program back there. Uh, with a graduate student on identifying what are the best practices nationally that we can incorporate into uh, enhancing our public engagement process, not just for our planning department, but for any big issue that's out there. And there is definitely staff resistance, even not knowingly, I would say. It's more because they know that this, it's not that there is a malicious intent to not include the public, but rather it's time and energy and ability. So we're struggling with that right now. We certainly are trying to instill certain values that we don't say quite sort of embrace the transparency, for example, and things like that. We, we're trying to make that part of our culture in Yolo County. And we've always been a very collaborative culture, so the idea that we work with other agencies, that part of Yolo County, we, yeah. we like that and do it well. But engaging the public early is a struggle for us. And just to bring it back to the fiscal piece, uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, which serves uh, entities throughout the, actually the world, has developed this model. And they say, if you have this in place, you will have a world-class financial system. So we want to have that because we don't want to have the deficits we've had in the past. So we've been steadily trying to bring it into our organization. They developed a survey in England that they're now applying in the U.S., one of the first counties in, in California to go through it. And what, what's the one thing it identified as a weakness for us that we need to put more energy into? Public engagement in our budgeting processes. So it, it came out loud and clear from that national body of evidence that that's one thing we don't do very well. So evidence like that helps support staff understanding why it's a priority for the board and why it's a priority for us. Did, 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 yeah, did the work you do, what about this mid-management question? So the thing that comes through in the training work that we do over and over again, I, I learned a lesson from a guy by the name of Ed Everett, who's a longtime city manager in Redwood City, and I, I trained with him. And he said that the thing that public sector officials really need to understand, that when it comes to public engagement, while you're not necessarily going to control the outcome, you still have a lot of power to control the process. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But everything from room setup to how your outreach techniques to whether you use a website or not or to the questions you ask to what's on the table and what's not on the table to how you communicate about what makes up the budget, all these other pieces, that really is still in your power. 
Um, and so that is at least a, a, an argument that can get people a little bit used to the fact that, oh, okay, so I'm not just going to blue sky this budget and we're going to start from a, you know, a blank piece of paper and we're going to say, well, what do you want? Um, it really is, there really is, are a set of processes and best practices already out there. There are websites and online uh, platforms that are really making this much more easy. Um, so it's about finding those things and, and practicing them. Uh, from an elected standpoint, I also think the relationship between your, uh, your chief executive officer and your electives is really critical because you have to have that communication with your city manager or your county administrator or whoever it is to make sure that the electives understand that they can't throw the staff under the bus when you get out there in the public. And it happens all the time. And so there has to be an understanding on the part of the electeds as well of what everybody's roles are and, okay. and, and, and that you have to play there. Let's take our last question. Michael? Uh, thank you very much for your very elucidating comments. I appreciate them all the time. I appreciate it. I want to tie back to the original data presentation. The assumption that someone could draw from that data or that survey is that the public is misinformed doesn't know anything. But I, and I'm listening to you, and I'm wondering whether this, the elected officials are the culprits, because the elected participants are not providing information that the public wants to hear <coughs> or knows to hear. So the problem is not we have a misinformed public, attributable to many reasons, individual, societal, well, lots of reasons. But it's really this, the problem is that Elected officials over decades have misinformed deliberately, somewhat, with some malfeasance, mm -hmm. to engage in the process of trying to hide information for various reasons, political, social reasons. So the problem is not the misinformation on the public or its knowledge, but the problem lies here with us, we do, or hold up or whoever. Well, then let's wrap that in. So that, that is a very provocative question. So let's wrap that up by giving each of our panelists, starting right here, get ready, uh, the <laughs> chance to address Professor Stimler's question uh, about what people need to know and what the obligation is to write. I guess I wouldn't restrict it to quite what you did in terms of elected officials. I'd say as public officials, we have a duty to educate, and I think that citizens have a duty to be educated. And we probably haven't been providing ample opportunity for us to educate in that way in terms of the basics of our brethren today. Mentioned. Both in information, content, and process. Correct. Okay. The other thing I would tag on to that with quickly is that I was recently at a forum where we had uh, legislators who had moved back to counties or vice versa and become local officials once again. And the difference they cited is that when they were in the Capitol, it was two teams playing positional politics or a positional mm -hmm. game where they were out to win. When they came back to the county, they were back on one team. And the way in which they acted was very different because to advance their agenda as part of one team was different than when they were in positional. Uh, politics and that there's an effect there okay. that we don't that fully understand. I say you could, you could argue that the governor's decisions in the last two years is a function of his experience, right? Well, certainly a function of his experience. Something, right? Kathy. <laughs> well, I would not disagree that um, with your statement that um, elected officials have have been culpable. In in Stockton, we have term limits, but in most cities, you do not, and. And so in Stockton, if you're going to become informed, um, you have to get on it right away. You've got to get involved. You've got to get, get into the League of Cities. The, the, clock, you is to, the clock is ticking. Okay. Um, but in a lot of other, in, in fact, in most other cities, that's not the case. And um, I agree with you. There's, um, nobody wants to give people bad news. And we have new council members. It's, it's, it's tough. Stuff. Being it's very hard.
that doesn't happen in very many places. It's hard. I mean, it, it really is hard to, to put the bad news out there because people don't want it. They just don't want it. And it's, it is a two-way street. Marcia, you've been seen as the statewide voice for, for pension change, pension reform. What's your reaction to, to Michael's challenge? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I saw this problem early on. Uh, in fact, I'm looking at my early memos, uh, 2002. Um, I, I, I knew we were on a, a bad path, regardless of what the economy was doing. And, I, and I, I always had the question, why did so many bright people make such dumb decisions? <laughs> and it was, it didn't have anything to do with politics, because I was seeing Republicans, mm -hmm. Democrats, everybody doing the same thing. And when you confront them, they have always the same, you know, we didn't know, I didn't know, who knew, who would have known. And, um, but once they knew, then to try to get them on board with opportunities for change, nobody wanted to get on board with what we needed to do for change. And that only came from the top, and that was the governor of California that actually made a commitment that we needed to change it, and he didn't back down. Um, but you couldn't get the help from the local people. I couldn't anyway. The value of the bully pulpit. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Pete, your, your final thought. Yeah, so just very quickly, whether what you're saying is true or not, I don't think is as important as where things are going from here on out. And so I just want to refer back to the data point from the study that we worked with uh, the Institute of Local Government on, which said that 85% of the official survey viewed public engagement in a much different way than when they had started their career with an average of being 22 years of service. And these were elected in staff, city and county, all in California. And I really do see this as what I would call a quiet revolution in the way that we do government. I think uh, both technology, crisis, and process is driving a higher degree of participation, uh, both from the grassroots up, but increasingly, as we've heard today, and I've seen this over and over again in places like Bell, Vallejo, Stockton even, you're seeing public sector officials that are actually leading public engagement processes looking for greater participation. And I really do believe that's where we're going to continue to head. Would you join me in thanking this panel for sharing your Also, let the panel join you in thanking uh, the Center for California Studies, particularly their executive director, uh, Steve Boylard, uh, Tara, for, for the terrific uh, support help. Uh, we've enjoyed ourselves, we've enjoyed having lunch with you, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll just to indulge for one more minute. Um, Michael Semler actually kind of stole what, I, what I've been thinking of formulating in some way to kind of summarize what I heard. You know, I, I, you think about it. Um, we're a democracy in this country, at a local level or, or, or state or federal level. It's a democratic uh, approach. And... Um, and there's a lot of organizations out there that are pointing out, you know, we're, we, our participation rates are pretty low. As citizens, we don't really engage in our democracy. And so there's a lot of efforts to try and increase our participation rate. Generally, we're knocking down barriers. Same day registration, motor voter, these kinds of things. And I think what we found from a lot of this research is, is it really such a great thing just to get these people who really have pretty bad understanding of, of issues to just get them into the polls or get them um, to connect more on, on making decisions. So what that leads to, I think, are, are kind of two ways to approach this, and, and both of them, I think, we kind of got to on this hand. One is, you know, we're, we're not just a democracy, we're a representative democracy. And, uh, and we have leaders who are elected who need to somehow, well, to, to what extent do you just represent um, the, the desires of your population versus um, show, exercising leadership? and helping to inform and lead that dialogue. So this is kind of a more positive way of what I think Michael was suggesting. That is, can, as elected leaders, uh, can there be a leading of, of this conversation and enlightening and, and uh, 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 guiding of, uh, of, of where the population wants to go? But the other side of it is, to what extent can, at the citizen level, can citizens become educated and informed in order to help lead from, from the grassroots? And I don't think we have an answer to that question, but I think somehow both of those are really important components to have a well-functioning democracy. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. It's been, a, I think, it's been a really good conversation. I appreciate the work of all our panelists, particularly Peter Detweiler, for making all this happen. Um, please help yourself some cookies on the way out, because I think I saw 
few extras back there. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Oh, fill out your survey.